So, so Clyde, you mentioned something about progressive disease, and, and I think it's probably the form of MS that's misdiagnosed the most in both directions. That is, not realizing it's MS and thinking it's MS, but it's actually something else. And I think that's one of the reasons that McDonald's still requires a, a year's history or observation of progression before you could say that it's primary progressive MS. And, and spinal fluid has consistently been a part of that diagnosis, but now, as, as Pat alluded to, it's more so. So let me just ask the group, uh, uh, Tom, are you doing more spinal taps now? In patients that do not meet uh, the dissemination in time criteria, but uh, from an MRI point of view, uh, certainly. Also, in older patients, where very often the differential diagnosis is much larger, uh, a spinal fluid examination can help to look at it. Uh, in a patient, a uh, young woman, age in the 20s, with uncomplicated unilateral optic neuritis, uh, I'm probably still a, a little bit more reluctant to do a lumbar puncture at that point in time, if I can fulfill the diagnostic criteria in one fell swoop, I understand that's an area where different practices practice a little bit differently. Obviously, I also come from the thought process, what do I need to make a decision to start or not start treatment in a patient such as uh, that one? If a patient has two or more lesions at the time of a clean, uh, crisp, clinically isolated syndrome, then for me that already fulfills the criteria that I need if these lesions are in the previously described telltale locations uh, that I need to make a treatment decision in such a patient. And so uh, from the point of view is what do I need at the time to in a way adjudicate uh, the future of this patient in terms of go on treatment, not go on treatment, uh, so yes, there is a little bit more uh, CSF, but I'm not necessarily categorically doing it. So, help. so pretty much what uh, Dr. Lies described, <clears throat> the only issue I have with the spinal fluid is, you know, how many oligoclonal bands are considered positive because the reports vary from one laboratory to the other, and I feel there is lack of standardization there. Well, I mean, if you have five oligoclonal bands and they're not in the serum, then that's uh, safe to say it's positive, but in the range of two to three, sometimes four bands, there is no standardization in terms of what's positive and what's not. So how do you view it? I tend to consider two and more that are absent in the serum to be positive. And are you doing more taps? Yes. Uh, as uh, Tom said, uh, you know, in a patient with CIS, and um, I'm looking for dissemination in time, I'm, I'm, I'm using that. The other issue I have with the criteria is um, what if the patient <coughs> has nonspecific symptoms that could suggest a relapse, such as increase in fatigue or uh, cognition changes um, or depression? and then you find a uh, enhanced lesion on the MRI. Um, is this uh, asymptomatic GAD enhancing lesion or not? Uh, so there are these uh, questions that surround the revised criteria that, in my view, need to be addressed. So you've long been a proponent of, of the value of, of analyzing CSF. Has it changed any since McDonald 2017? In principle, we spinal tap everybody in a disease where you have no diagnostic biomarker. We also practice in a Lyme endemic area. Uh, we've actually found spinal fluid very helpful with regard to how certain we can be of the diagnosis in counseling of uh, uh, the patient, et cetera. So right now, we standardly do it in everybody for the diagnosis. Jamie? At the risk of being the dissenting uh, voice here, um, I would say I don't know that with the revision of the McDonald criteria we are doing spinal taps any more frequently. And um, I maybe am a little bit more uh, permissive or I don't know what the right word would be, but um, I think that if um, uh, in atypical cases where it, uh, you know the presentation, the MRI doesn't look typical, uh, then I think there really is a role with progressive uh, sort of presentations. I think there is a role to do uh, spinal fluid. 
but I also uh, have an accumulated clinical experience, and maybe this is like a, 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 a fatal uh, a hubris, but uh, I, I tend to think if it looks like a duck and it walks like a duck, uh, that it's a duck. So I think the criteria are important, but I also think that you have to uh, exercise uh, some clinical judgment if you have an accumulated experience. And that's a very important point. The criteria are really guidelines, right? And Clyde? So um, the thing that I'm most interested about the spinal fluid, and it's an inter interesting conversation to have with patients if they want to have it done or not, because sometimes they're hearing about a spinal tap being the worst thing in the world and headaches and everything else. Um, but I have to be honest that when you really sit down and have that conversation with patients, a lot of times they want that additional confirmation. Like they say, if you think I should get it, I'll get it. And you know, maybe I do or I don't, but they kind of feel like that's more confirmatory. And I think it's a helpful thing for them to be able to know for sure, even though we say the MRI is good enough or the clinical is good enough, that extra little piece gives them another piece of reassurance that it's not a, you know, a, another disease phenotype or anything like that. There's one other piece to this I think that's potentially interesting, and this is just early work that we've been trying to address, is whether or not band number might be a predictor of severity of the disease. And at some point, we may be able to say, everybody should get tapped because we need this information to be able to predict how this individual is going to go. If they have more than 10 algoclonal bands, maybe their course is going to be more aggressive, and we should be more aggressive about their therapy up front versus somebody who's maybe not as. Uh, so this is a piece that's ongoing, but I think it, it, it helps us in our ability to think about how we're going to manage these people. And it's worthwhile mentioning there are spinal fluid red flags against the diagnosis of MS. You don't expect a very high cell count. You don't expect a very high total protein. You're accessing the central nervous system compartment. If you're going to make a diagnosis, a lifelong diagnosis, make treatment decisions, have the patient behind you that you're confident, then I think with the lack of a diagnostic biomarker, why wouldn't you want a robust evaluation of the patient? If I may take us back to the other biomarkers that we talked about, the MRI. I think uh, one of the very important things that we perhaps also need to bring to the table is the fact that, with the fact that MRI has become important in the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis, the technical quality of the MRIs is also important. And I would like to refer to the criteria that have been proposed by the consortium of MS centers as minimal criteria, uh, where uh, many of the community acquired scans still have relatively large slice thickness and sometimes even skip sequences where there is an area that is not imaged in the brain. And I would also uh, put in a little bit of a word to actually review the MRI scans because a lot of things where the radiologist right in the right context this could potentially represent multiple sclerosis isn't necessarily a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis, perhaps more a risk management from the radiologist's point of view. And I would think that everybody sitting at this table probably also reviews the scans of the patients uh, where we make a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. So I don't think that we can rely on the radiologist's report solely in, a, a, in, in getting to a diagnosis of MS. And this is a, a big cause for misdiagnosis. We, we have our weekly case review conference, and there's just that band of, of white matter between the cortex and the periventricular area that we just call the nonspecific zone, and it just sort of follows almost like a, 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 a boomerang-type shape of nonspecific lesions that frequently get sent to us that has nothing to do with MS at all. So overreading or misreading the, uh, the MRI is a big cause of difficulty.